بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم My dear students of Ajman University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences Today we're gonna start with a new topic important topic to pharmacists and that is uh, parentrals parentrals is an important topic that you will encounter not only in community pharmacy but also uh, more so in hospitals the outcomes for this topic is that you should be able to list the advantages and disadvantages of uh, parental administration and uh, you should define what do you mean by uh, parental uh, administration and what are these routes and you should be able to tell us about the risk and benefits of various parental routes uh, you are supposed to tell us about uh, whether aqueous or non-aqueous vehicles that are used in parental products and the challenges uh, with these uh, products you will also uh, be able uh, and should be able to calculate osmolality and osmolarity and define the relationship with tonicity uh, you should be able to compare a small volume to large volume parentrals uh, you should be able to outline uh, and talk about different methods of sterilization for parental products you should be able also to differentiate between the packaging requirements for a single dose and a multiple uh, dose <coughs> and uh, you should be able also to uh, tell us about the precautions and measures that you should uh, use when you want to dispose uh, hazard materials such as chemotherapeutic uh, substances and you should be able to tell us about the differences between uh, total parental nutrition and total nutritional admi admixtures these are the uh, uh, things that you should be able to do when we inshallah finish the uh, parental uh, chapter or topic it's uh, the longest chapter so please pay attention we're gonna divide this uh, topic to three parts and today we will uh, talk about the first part uh, starting with what do we mean by uh, parental what do we mean by that uh, in pharmacy we are talking about injectable routes of administration so when we say parentals we are talking about injectable routes of drug administration where does this word come from it comes from a greek word para entron para entron para means outside and entrons mean the intestine so if you want to take it uh, like word by word it means any other route uh, uh, any other route than oral route okay uh, يعني, any route other than oral route but as I tell I, as I already told you uh, we are talking here about uh, uh, injectable routes of drug administration what do we mean by injections okay if uh, there is a title injection injection refers to a sterile okay pyrogen limited uh, sometimes we don't like to say pyrogen free because the test we do is uh, testing whether uh, there is a little so of pyrogen that it doesn't cause problem or not it, it we are not able to detect maybe uh, very small quantities of pyrogen that may be there that's why we say pyrogen limited so these are sterile preparations that are pyrogen limited and when we say pyrogen here mainly we are talking about bacterial endotoxin units okay there is a limit in these units and these injections are intended to be administered parentally okay now what do we mean by 
uh, bacterial endotoxin units because uh, the the bacterial endotoxin is the main main primary source for pyrogen it's not the only uh, thing but it's the main thing that we usually check for okay now these are coming from uh, gram negative bacteria when the bacteria uh, you know break down uh, it will shed uh, these uh, products organic products from the cell wall outer cell wall of gram negative bacteria and the problem with them is that they can cause fever and hypotension uh, the hypotension will result in shock okay so we don't want them to be uh, available in uh, more than certain limit because that's what they're gonna do if they are exceeding uh, the limit for pyrogene now if someone asks you okay what are the advantages and disadvantages of administering a drug parentally one of the things you can mention and this is uh, especially when we talk about IV administration that you will be able to get rapid action because here you are putting the drug directly into systemic circulation rather for example than taking the drug uh, to the GIT where it has to be digested and absorbed and goes to the liver first and then to the systemic circulation and slowly slowly start building up the concentration to give you an effect no at time zero when you inject all of the drug is already in the systemic circulation that's why it's very useful in case of emergencies also if the patient is unconscious uncooperative or cannot accept or tolerate oral medication then this will be a good route uh, another thing you know for some drugs like for example insulin you cannot take uh, an insulin tablet you know uh, and expect to have a good effect uh, because it will be destroyed in the GIT okay so the drug especially proteinous drug uh, uh, they are ineffective in any other route but the uh, parental route of course there are some breakthrough where some proteins may be administered by inhalation and there are some works uh, for drugs to be administered orally but still uh, they are not very popular or very successful attempts except for the inhalation okay there are some successful products at least two of them were in the market but they didn't gain the popularity uh, they deserve okay now the disadvantages uh, include you need someone to administer the injection okay and usually either physician or a nurse uh, will be needed of course there are some exception uh, especially uh, in the case of subcontinuous administration of some uh, products uh, uh, especially here we are talking about uh, insulin injections you know you don't afford uh, uh, for a nurse to come and give a diabetic patient insulin every day uh, maybe more than one time so usually the patient is able to do that and it is by subcontinuous ish injection subcontinuous is one of the parental routes additionally and this is another uh, disadvantages is that you need to do it usually in a hospital that's the usual case you go to a hospital and then they give you uh, an injection also uh, and this adds uh, cost and a lot of precautions is that these product need to be sterile and pyrogen limited so you need to make sure uh, uh, that uh, no contamination happens with the uh, sterile product uh, uh, every time you have to take enough precaution and this will increase the cost now if we want to list the main routes okay not all the routes but the main routes uh, that are parental considered as parental and I want you to, to look at this figure 
uh, you have the intramuscular and you see how deep the needle penetrates for intramuscular root okay you will see that it's the longest needle okay and you will see here also a number 20 okay and then when we talk about intravenous the needle is smaller a little bit smaller here and look at the number and you will see that it's not as deep as in the muscular administration and then you have the subcontinuous which is even comes with smaller needle okay and then you have the intradermal okay this is the intradermal type intradermal is also referred as intracutaneous we subcutaneous is also referred to as hypodermic and don't forget about these abbreviations because as a pharmacist you need to be familiar with these abbreviations okay okay what you saw here is that the one at the almost uppermost surface of the skin is the intradermal and the one that is really deep requiring maybe longer needle and thicker needle as well to be able to insert it deep uh, is the intramuscular and what you see here now here is the gauge number okay and gauge refers uh, it's a number that refers to the outer thickness of the needle okay and the lower the number the thicker is the uh, needle or the outside diameter of the needle okay that's why you will see that it is uh, thinner as you are not inserting the needle deep into the skin to start with we have the intravenous root and in intravenous root there are some risks as we said there is nothing without risk for example uh, the possibility of blood clots forming okay when you do or uh, administer the uh, drug and this blood clot may move from the place where it was formed to another place and in this case they call it embolus I will show you a video so you know what do we mean by uh, thrombosis and embolism and get familiar with that. In a healthy body, your blood flows smoothly and effortlessly through the 60,000 miles of vessels, delivering oxygen, nutrients and hormones and removing waste along the way. But from time to time, problems can arise, often due to blockages that can result from high cholesterol, atherosclerosis, or other conditions. And these blockages can occlude vessels. They can produce sudden thrombosis or clot, which obstructs the flow of blood and results in dead tissue. When a blood clot forms in a blood vessel, it's called a thrombus. If the clot breaks free and travels to and lodges in another part of the body, it's called an embolus. These clots then are discharged and shot through the body like bullets. And where they strike, uh, they can do some serious damage, particularly if that's in such a delicate piece of tissue as your brain. If an embolus lands in the brain, it most often leads to stroke. If it lands in the heart, it usually causes a heart attack. If it lands in the lungs, it's called pulmonary embolism. The lungs are especially vulnerable to embolism because blood passes through the lungs every time it circulates to and from the heart. Often, a number of clots will shower the lungs in an episode of pulmonary embolism. Once this happens, the situation can be a life-threatening emergency. Uh, okay, this was a video to just uh, know the difference between thrombus and embolus. Uh, another thing uh, uh, you need to consider uh, when you are administering a drug by IV is that there is no absorption. Okay, it's not a factor. Okay, and uh, since there is no absorption, there is no first pass metabolism, IV dose may differ greatly from oral dose. Of course, the IV dose will be uh, less if it differs, okay? Uh, another thing or another risk is unlike oral administration where you can induce vomiting, once you administer the drug intravenously, you cannot retrieve it, okay? But 
if uh, a patient take a drug you can induce vomiting in order to get rid of this drug uh, if you look at the dorsal forearms okay then the basilic and cephalic veins are uh, the mean uh, the main veins that are used to administer uh, the drug but of course it can be also administered in other places also if you look at this uh, uh, syringe okay this is a syringe and uh, we call this piece here okay the one that goes inside the parallel this is graduated parallel okay you see here how it's graduated 30 40 etc uh, here it's units so you have to pay attention whether uh, it's units or ml okay uh, so you have this barrel graduated barrel and then you have a plunger inside where it allows you to withdraw and push the medication here the needle you have the needle and at the end of the needle you have the heel and then this one is called bevel and the end point is called point okay now when more or most clinician when they want to insert the needle to administer the drug they keep the bevel facing upward okay uh, and the reason for that and you have to pay attention for this is that when the drug is released into the vein or pushed into the vein it goes with the direction of blood flow that is when the bevel is facing upward if it is facing downward then it might interrupt the blood flow and this might cause the problem we talked about the formation of blood clots okay so that's why most clinicians they prefer to keep the bevel upward because these are the parts we talked about barrel blunger uh, needle here we have cap when the clinician or the nurse or physician they uh, do the injection okay they have to follow strict aseptic precautions you already dealing with sterile product that you want to inject and you don't want the uh, uh, the product to be contaminated with uh, bacteria or something else that's why uh, you follow aseptic ish precautions you follow aseptic precautions these include for example wiping the uh, area of injection with alcohol swaps so you wipe that area in order to prevent anything or any bacteria on the skin to enter into your system when you are doing the injection okay this is one of the precautions now when we say aseptic what do we mean by aseptic aseptic is a procedure where you prevent anything from outside environment to contaminate your product that the one you are dealing with okay now in IV you can administer large volume or small volume per intervals and we will talk about the difference between these two for large volume this includes H nutrients plasma volume ex expanders electrolytes amino acids and other therapeutic agents might be added in the large volume per intral. okay طبعاً, anything more than 100 ml we consider it as large volume uh, also small volume parenteral can be used okay now if you want to think about okay we have seen this maybe you visited someone in the hospital and you saw an IV bag and this bag uh, this IV bag was dri dripping into the veins of the patient you are visiting now how fast usually or commonly how fast is the flow rate usually it ranges from 42 to 150 ml per hour this is how fast okay just for you to imagine one cup of water is 250 ml this is one cup of water type if you want to think about uh, this one 
uh, per minute then you will divide it by 60 and you will have a range of 0.7 to 2.5 ml per ish minute okay uh, just for you to know what is 1 ml 1 ml consists of 20 drops okay this is 1 ml consists of 20 drops so when I say 0.7 it's about uh, 14 drops in a minute and when I say 2.5 it's about 50 drops in a minute okay uh, that is because 1 ml is equivalent to almost 20 drops. Tayyip, usually the IV products or products administered by IV, they are aqueous solution. They cannot be suspension. In some cases, IV fat emulsion may be used, for example, as a source of calories, okay, by providing essential fatty acids essential and non-essential fatty acids to uh, the patient okay so it's possible to administer IV fat emulsion of course the emulsion will be H oil in water or water in oil it will be oil in water because the blood body fluids they are aqueous okay so it has to be oil in water one of the uh, uh, preparations that are administered uh, parenterally analgesics okay these are very strong analgesics okay for example if the patient is having cancer and there is a lot of pain okay they may administer uh, uh, an analgesic usually how they do it they do it as uh, intramuscular depot but there is an IV uh, device uh, which you see here, see PCA, a patient controlled analgesia. This device will allow the patient, whenever he feels so pain, maybe because of the condition he's having, it allows him to press on the button, okay, in order to receive uh, an analgesic dose, usually opioid, strong opioid and this analgesic uh, dose will relieve the patient from the pain of course uh, uh, you know he the patient will not be able to you know press continue pressing hundred times and uh, every time it will deliver uh, the uh, analgesic no there is a limit to how many times the patient can press in a short period of time type uh, then this patient controlled or PCA patient controlled analgesia has an advantage compared to IM depot injection is that the this IM depot injection will be or you need a nurse or someone to provide it for the patient okay and of course how fast can you uh, ask for uh, uh, such injection how fast okay let's say you have a pain or the patient is having a pain so he's calling the nurse the nurse will uh, ask for the drug to be uh, provided to her in order to give you the injection uh, and these are usually opioids yani controlled drugs they don't come easily so it takes a lot of time okay but with patient controlled analgesia this can happen ish more quickly and faster and there is no need for <coughs> drug absorption process here so the relief for the patient will be better using uh, IV PCA but PCA devices can be used not only for IV but for subcutaneous and epidural administration epidural يعني, uh, in your spinal cord okay uh, you know for example some uh, women uh, when when they are pregnant and they won't want to deliver babies uh, some of the advertisements telling them if you want painless delivery we can provide you that uh, and what they do is they give them uh, uh, an anesthet anesthetic uh, for uh, epidural administration type now these devices can be of two types either a fixed dose is uh, injected 
whenever asked for okay intermittently just a single dose or there is continuous infusion of the drug and when it's required you know you have severe pain okay this continuous infusion is not enough you having a break through or break uh, uh, down in and you are having a lot of pain in this case you can demand a dose you can press a button and it will give you age the required dose now that was regarding the uh, intravenous route now for intramuscular uh, route as you will see here uh, it's either usually in the uh, and this is the preferred side for adults the upper outer quadrant of gluteus maximus okay or in the mid-lateral uh, muscles of the thigh or in the deltoid uh, region okay this these are the usual places for uh, infants and children they prefer the mid-lateral muscles and the deltoid muscles because uh, the muscle here is usually not developed well in infants and it consists of, uh, with a lot of fats and also if the infant is moving there is the sciatica nerve that will cause uh, a big pain and problem to the patient and you want to avoid that that's why because this muscle is not developed the physicians they prefer to use the mid-lateral muscles of the thigh which is well developed in infants okay طيب. of course the effect is less rapid than uh, intravenous because here you have an absorption process and because it's less rapid and it's deep uh, in the muscles usually we use the route for uh, drugs that we want to we want to ish to have long duration of action okay uh, if you are dealing with solution the absorption of the drug will be more rapid than if it is in suspension okay and if you are administering uh, a solution a drug in the form of solution the absorption of this drug will be more rapid than if it is in suspension and uh, aqueous preparation will be more rapid than oleogenous preparations I'm talking about the absorption okay how fast is the absorption how fast it can be Faisan we agreed that for solutions the absorption is faster than suspension and for aqueous preparation it is faster than oleogenous preparations why because aqueous preparations uh, get or uh, it's miscible with the body fluid so once you inject it it can age it can merge with the body fluid and the drug can be absorbed more rapidly oleogenous preparation will not mix rapidly with the body fluid and that's why the drug will need to age to partition out to come out from this oleogenous preparation uh, in order to dissolve in the body fluid how much I can inject the gluteus maximus will buttock you can inject a, a maximum of 5 ml but the deltoid region the maximum is about 2 ml now there are some medications that will cause irritation or staining to the skin so if you do injection intramuscular injection for example uh, iron dextran okay iron dextran injection it can cause staining to the skin diazepam injection طبعاً, iron dextran is for iron diazepam is for calming and uh, sedation etc now diazepam can cause irritation of the skin and iron dextran can cause staining dark brown staining of the skin what happens if you do these injections you are doing an intramuscular injection and once you remove the needle the solution will go out up okay and it will cause the staining of this part so the solution comes from here up 
so in order to avoid this you can use what we call the Z track technique uh, in how you do that before the injection you pull pull the uh, skin as you see here with the finger you pull it backward and then you do the injection and then when you remove the needle then you allow the skin ish to be back and by doing that the medication will stay ish in this area as you see it here it will stay in this area because uh, there is no continuous a channel for the drug to go upward okay طيب. the third route that we want to talk about who is subcutaneous route يعني under the skin and the area اللي هي بتكون في upper arms as you see or in the anterior uh, thigh في anterior thigh or the lower abdomen around the belly button or what we call the navel okay these are the administration sites and uh, the maximum amount that you can inject is 1.3 ml this is the maximum volume you can inject and it is the uh, popular site for injecting insulin okay so uh, insulins that are administered by the patient the patients themselves this insulin is administered subcontinuously of course rotating the sites every time you do the injection you don't do it all on the same uh, place okay now this is important uh, in you know what is the gauge for insulin and the length of the needle because you don't want the insulin injections to cause any pain for uh, the uh, patients okay that's why they should be very thin so 25 to 30 is considered very thin needle and thin needles will not cause a lot of pain also you will notice that their length is very small it's uh, less than one one centimeter to one centimeters and something okay one and a half centimeter and this is very it's considered as very small length it's very thin very small the reason we don't want it to cause patient to the uh, we don't want uh, the needle to cause pain to the patients okay now according to united states pharmacopoeias what are the types or categories of injection there are five categories and you need to recognize them and differentiate between them that's why uh, what you're gonna read now you will find it in the title of the product okay if the product is referred to as for example insulin injection so this is the title injection then what do we mean by the word injection of course first of all if it is referred to as injection drug product referred to as injection not the vehicle okay I'm talking about drug product if it is injection then it's a sterile preparation and it's in the form of liquid solution and it's not suspension it's not emulsion it's a solution it's a clear liquid okay if it is an injection these are drug substances that are maybe in the form of liquid or solutions of drug dissolved in a vehicle okay طيب another as you will see here okay for injection okay the drug for injection here the drug will be in the solid form okay so I'm talking here about solid drug and if you add the suitable solvent that is or the suitable vehicle that is mentioned that is required then it will form a solution confirming to injection okay it will be like injection now because it's a dry powder and not ready to use we call it ish for injection does it remind you of something for suspension for solution okay 
before injection okay so once you add the suitable vehicle you will have the injection the solution and we have injectable emulsion okay injectable emulsion this is the title okay and here the drug substances uh, is dissolved or dispersed in emulsion medium is then you have emulsion and uh, uh, these are preparations that can be administered intramuscularly or by IV another type of preparation injectable suspension injectable suspension these are liquid preparation yes and you're ready to use containing solid particles suspended in a suitable liquid medium yani it's ready to use of course we do not inject suspension into IV usually they are injected where intramuscularly the fifth one and the last one is for injectable suspension which means I'm talking about dry solids if you add the suitable solvent then it will give you an injectable suspension okay uh, you have example here okay uh, uh, for injectable suspension okay so if you add the suitable vehicle then it will become like that so what is the title the title is for injectable suspension now you have to know that how fast the drug will uh, act or will be absorbed maybe from subcutaneous or intramuscular side it depends on the chemical form or salt of the drug what salt or what base I'm using what is the uh, physical state of the injection is it uh, solution or suspension is it aqueous or oily all these are important now as I explained before and I want you to remember what I said before aqueous suspension produces more rapid action than oleogenous suspension why because aqueous suspension uh, is miscible with the body fluid unlike the oleogenous suspension with intramuscular administration when uh, the drug is having a long uh, uh, action and yani it's maybe for weeks or month okay with the intramuscular injection we call this uh, uh, depot that we inject we call it re repository or depot preparations that are intended for long action now most preparations that in the dry form whether for suspension or for ish Yani for uh, uh, injectable suspension or for injection yani for making solution or for making suspension they are prepared by a process called freeze drying or lyophilization and I want you to remember in pharmaceutics one when I talked about this method in preparing instantly uh, dissolving or disintegrating tablets this was one of the method of preparation why why for parental products in the dry form before we are adding the uh, suitable vehicle why these products are preferred to be prepared by this method the reason is as I said uh, it can be reconstituted easily it can be wetted easily and also with this method I will be able to get sterilized product yani the, the process itself allows me to get if the product is already sterile it allows me to get a sterile product sterile, sterile powder and if I add the suitable vehicle to it it will be easily reconstituted okay type now usually when the bottle says or the container says there is 30 ml usually it contains little extra طبعاً, this little extra depends on several factors including the viscosity but 
the the question is why there is little excess why there is extra the reason is to allow us to withdraw and administer the required uh, uh, volume because as you know you cannot withdraw all the liquid to the last drop from the container you cannot do you cannot take the whole thing completely 100% from the container okay that's why we need little excess to be able to, to get the required volume now we're gonna talk about solvents and vehicles used in injection okay what are they we need to know what are they and how to differentiate between them the first one okay is water for injection Shufu, here for injection does it mean I'm talking about dry powder no okay I'm talking about vehicle I'm not talking about drug here okay so when I say water for injection does it mean it's sterile because I said injection no because I'm taking I'm talking about specific things solvents and vehicles okay type for water specifically for water okay I have to mention whether it's sterile or not it ha I have to mention that for other types I can just say injection and it means it's sterile okay why because for water water for injection is not uh, necessary sterile okay but it's pyrogen limited or pyrogen free so it's uh, actually water for injection is purified water and you remember how we produce purified water whether by distillation or reverse osmosis and purified water means not more than one milligram per 100 ml of solid particles but additionally to the purified water as I told you it's ash pyrogen free which means they have done ash uh, testing for pyrogen type it's not sterile so what is it used for it's used in the manufacture of injectable products in the ash after adding the water you need to sterilize the whole preparation because you remember that uh, when we defined injections we said that they are sterile okay type sterile water for injection it may contain slightly more solids than purified purified should not contain or the water for injection should not contain more than one milligram now with sterile it may contain more than the water for injection because the process of sterilization that usually in, involve heating may result in leaching of some solids from the containers okay from the tanks where you have the uh, sterilization happening okay particles may leach that's why corresponding to water for injection they may have little more uh, total solid contents okay now what is it used for it can be used as a solvent or a vehicle for preparation already sterilized okay but you need here to use the aseptic technique okay to prevent contamination getting into your injectable medications so for bacteriostatic water for injection okay only I said here sterile after that I don't need to say sterile madam there is injection it means sterile type but in addition here we are saying bacteriostatic because we are adding a preservative so a preservative has been added and usually preservatives contains benzyl alcohol and do you remember when we talked about benzyl alcohol and gas being syndrome fee in neonates it can cause death that's why the USP asked that it should be clearly labeled not for use in neonates or newborns Clear, clearly state that another preparation is referred to as sodium chloride injection USP 
طيب is this sterile yes مدام في injection it is sterile only when it's water water for injection or sterile water for injection you have to mention okay طيب sodium chloride is a sterile solution additionally it's ish isotonic solution and isotonic solution will have a concentration of 0.9 a percent W by V this is the concentration of uh, 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 isotonic solution of sodium chloride okay normal saline uh, now we can use it uh, as it is or as a vehicle for other injections we have also bacteriostatic sodium chloride injection manato here I have added a preservative that's why it should be ish I should mention not for use in neonates the label must mention that very clearly because of benzyl alcohol again number six ringers injection sometimes uh, if you go to the hospital they will give it uh, uh, an abbreviation R injection R injection refers to Ringer's injection and Ringer's solution is sterile or Ringer's injection these are sterile solution containing 1 sodium chloride 2 potassium chloride 3 calcium chloride and they are provided uh, either alone or with other drug uh, for replenishing for replenishing uh, electrolyte yani lost electrolyte from the body you are uh, trying to uh, substitute that lost or that loss and as a plasma volume expander yani for example when someone loses plasma or a lot of uh, liquids from the body then they may use that Similar to Ringer's uh, injection, we have lactated Ringer's injection or LR, lactated Ringer's injection. It is same ingredients here, but in addition, it contains also sodium lactate. And sodium lactate will uh, uh, allow the preparation to be used as systemic alkalizer. Yani when your body is little acidic okay uh, your blood is little acidic like ketoacidosis like for diabetes for example okay I can use uh, this lactated ringer injection to correct that in addition it can be used to replenish uh, electrolytes okay what about non aqueous vehicle can we use them yes of course we might not use them for IV depending taban but uh, uh, they can be used in parenteral preparations but they have to have certain properties for example they should not be toxic non-irritating compatible with other uh, chemicals can be easily sterilized does not have high vapor pressure so I can sterilize it easily uh, it should be uh, absorbed by the uh, body tissues for example a mineral oil cannot be used it cannot be used why because it cannot be absorbed by body tissues but we can use for example corn oil cottonseed oil peanut oil sesame oil and occasionally we may use castor oil and olive oil other than oil we have glycerine polyethylene glycol propylene glycol alcohol can also be used most oleogenous injections are administered ish intramuscularly okay this which you need to know you cannot uh, administer an oil into an IV type what are other substances that may be added you might add a preservative maybe there not for neonates if you remember okay preservatives include and I hope you remember that thiomerizal okay organic mercurial compound we have benzylconium chloride the cationic surface active uh, agent 
and we have other agents such as phenoxyethanol, benzyl alcohol, methyl parabene, propyl parabene, chlorobutanol, cresol, phenol. Also, other than preservative, you might need to add buffers, okay, to control the pH. You might need solubilizer to add solubilizers, okay, uh, to make sure that uh, the preparation is in solution, for example, not in suspension. You might need to add antioxidant such as sulfur dioxide or the salts, potassium, sodium salts of uh, sulfide, bisulfide, and meta bisulfides. Okay, other, other adjuncts may be added. Now, in the container containing uh, the medicine or the liquid preparation, you might replace the space above the preparation with nitrogen, you are removing uh, gas, okay, removing air and replacing it with nitrogen because it's inert gas and it will allow uh, the preparation or it will prevent the preparation from being oxidized if you don't want to add antioxidant uh, agents like what you see here okay uh, we'll stop here inshallah in the next uh, part we will talk about uh, tonicity isotonicity osmolarity milli equivalence uh, methods of sterilization uh, in the next part. I hope uh, you enjoyed the lecture. Have a nice day.